So Paul says, beginning there in verse 1 as he writes, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. Now let's skip down to verse 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. And if you bear with me, I'm going to read a couple of verses from chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice in me. So as we go back to chapter 1, verse 6, you might see some common themes that are addressed. Paul speaks a few times of the day of Christ. Paul speaks of his joy regarding the Philippian church and their joy that they share with him. And this joy is anchored in the gospel. It is centered in the proclamation of Jesus Christ. And he speaks about God's power working in them and working through them. That the one, God, who has begun that good work in them, he will be sure to complete that good work in them. And that even as God is the one who is the initiator of their faith, even, if, even as God is the core of their salvation, yet you notice that they are commanded, in, in spite of that glimpse of the eternal workings of their salvation, they are yet commanded in their lives and in their church, just as we are, for themselves to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Not to take it lightly. They have a testimony that they are to carry, as Paul says, in, in the, uh, to be as lights in the world and to be a testimony to those who are without God and without Christ. They are to hold fast the word of life. Now, they are not to forget that God is the one who has anchored them in Christ. For, as he says in chapter 2, verse 13, it's God who works in them. It's God who works in them both to will and to do his good pleasure. And yet, even with that glimpse of the eternal nature of their salvation, they are yet called to be accountable. They are yet called to work out their own salvation. They are called to hold fast the word of life. They are called to be lights in the world. So, 
back to verse 6 of chapter 1. Paul says that he is confident towards them. When he thinks about them, he is confident regarding their good work in the gospel, regarding their salvation. The, the glowing words, the emotional uh, address that Paul writes here regarding the Philippians, it's really only matched by his writing to the Thessalonians. When you read the Thessalonians, the Thessalonian letters, when you read the letter of Philippians, you can see that these were churches with whom Paul was very close, with whom Paul was very personal, who, who regarded Paul as, as a beloved apostle. You can read other letters where it's not quite that way. You can read the Corinthian letters where Paul is defending his place as an apostle. It, he's, he's defending his work and ministry among them. But with the Philippians and with the Thessalonians, he is confident of their love and of their joy and of the gospel that they have believed in. Yet, I would like to address this verse regarding its, let's call it its commercial interpretation. It's a verse that might be found on a bookmark or a bumper sticker. It's a verse that might be well rehearsed and memorized by Christians because we want to be confident that he, God, who has begun a good work in us, yes, that he will indeed complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. That when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we will not stand there nakedly, but clothed in his righteousness, clothed in his gospel, cleansed by his blood, and confident to stand in the presence of the one who holds the iron scepter of righteousness with which he rules and executes justice. We want to be confident when we stand in his presence, the one whose eyes burn like rays of fire. We want to be confident when we stand in the presence of Christ. For we shall not stand in the presence of the one who is meek and mild. We shall not stand in the presence of the one who stooped down to write on the ground. We shall not stand before that one who was humbled by his human form. We shall stand before the one that Peter, James, and John saw transfigured on the mount. We shall stand before the one who radiates the glory of God. We shall stand before the one who strikes terror into our hearts. We don't think of Jesus like that. And we don't think of ourselves like that in his presence. Because we have a perverted gospel that we have believed in. We have a perverted faith that we have professed. That we do not need to be righteous like the righteous one. We do not really have to conform our lives to the life of the righteous one. It doesn't matter what we say and what we do and how we act and how we live because everything's under the blood. We don't need to be concerned about our testimony. We don't need to be concerned that with one mouth we praise the Lord and with that same mouth we curse men. We don't need to be concerned about these things. We don't need to be concerned about the sins of our heart, about the sins of our life, whether sin's hidden or sin's open because it's all under the blood and Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. We have a perverted gospel that has convinced us. We have a gospel from the devil himself who has deceived us that our lives don't matter, that nothing we do or say matters. The devil has deceived us into thinking we need not work out our salvation in fear and trembling before Christ himself. And how is it that we have deceived ourselves? because of a verse taken out of context. Many verses like it, but I bring your attention to this verse. Oh, we quote it. Oh, we say we believe it. We're confident of this very thing. The one who began that good work in us, because I'm a Christian and I profess faith in Christ, he's gonna complete that work, whether or not I'm joining in that work, whether or not it looks like I'm bearing the fruit of that work, He's going to work it all out, and when I stand before Jesus, all of my profanity, all of my perversity, all of my shaming of the gospel, all of my shaming of the name of Christ, it'll just all melt away before Jesus, meek and mild, and I shall be a little lamb in his arms. Well, I'm not sure that we are in solid ground to do so, we use this verse 
to comfort ourselves, to say we are confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in us, he who has begun this work of salvation as it's normally interpreted, he who has begun a good work in us will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So you got nothing to worry about. Don't let sin convict you. Don't let the Holy Spirit bring things to mind that you should confess before God and Christ, that you might be forgiven, that his blood might cleanse you from all sin. Don't be worried about those kinds of things. Don't be worried about how you behave at work, let alone how you behave at church. Don't worry about how you love or don't love your spouse. Don't worry about how you treat your children. Don't worry about how you honor or dishonor your parents. Don't worry about all these things because he is faithful to complete the good work he has begun in you. It's all under the blood and you need not worry, believer. Be comforted in your sin. Be comfortable in your perversity because I'm confident that you're going to make it to heaven. And I'm confident that you're going to stand before Christ. I read from the words of Jesus about those who were confident to stand in the presence of the Son of Man when he judges. And Jesus tells us in his famous Sermon on the Mount what he shall say to these confident people. Depart from me, for I never knew you. Out of my sight, cast into darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. For those who have been self-deceived, for those who have been falsely confident, Let us not ever take the Bible and verses like this to comfort us in our sin, to comfort us in our carnality and in our worldliness and in our compromising of the principles and teachings of Christ. What is Paul saying here to the Philippians? How should they have understood it? Well, it isn't difficult. If we wouldn't take it out of context, why was Paul confident about them? And perhaps for the same reason, why should we not be confident with them? Let us read it again. Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Now we want to be part of the you because the you Paul is very confident about in verse 6. I want to be part of the you that he thinks about when he prays. Now you might say, well, I'm not part of the Philippian church. This isn't 1,900 years ago. How can I be part of the you? In principle, as we interpret this passage, it explains to us things that we can think about regarding our present place in Christianity and in the church, let alone in the sight of Christ. And we can take the principles here and apply them directly to us if we do so correctly. We have seen that we can do so incorrectly. So... Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. Now here, here it is. Here it is. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. For your fellowship in the gospel. For your partnership. For your sharing in with me regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul is confident regarding God's work in their life because he can see the outworking of God's work in their life. He speaks about the fruits of righteousness in verse 11 being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ through the glory and praise of God. And here we see the fruits of that righteousness in verse 5 and verse 6. They have a fellowship, they have a partnership with Paul in the gospel. Ever since they heard the gospel, and you can go back to the book of Acts, you can read about Paul's ministry in Philippi. We spoke a little bit about it last week. You remember Paul and Silas in that Philippian prison and the Philippian jailer who was saved through that whole scenario. 
and how he brought Paul and Silas home and, and uh, cared for their wounds and, and, and took care of them. And a church was planted in that city. And that church was a faithful church with faithful people, not perfect people. Paul will name some of them by name about the conflicts they are having within the church. It's not a perfect church, but it's a church that Paul could say, you bring me joy every time I think about you. I am filled with joy. It causes me to want to pray for you. Every time I think about you, I fall on my knees and I give thanks to God for you because you are with me in fellowship with the gospel of Christ. You are with me, a partaker, a sharer within. You are, you are those who are truly engaged in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You haven't just received it, you are now living it. And the fruits of righteousness are seen in your life. And because of that, Paul says, I am confident of this very thing, that God has certainly begun a good work in you. And I believe that that good work he started, he will complete it because I see the outworkings of what he is doing within you. So if we want to claim this verse, if we want to be part of the you that Paul is so thankful for, we need to be those who are truly partakers in the gospel. Those who are fellow servants in the gospel. Those who live our lives by the gospel. If the fruit of the gospel, the fruits of righteousness, the fruit of the Spirit, if the fruits of God's good work can be seen in us, then when people look at our lives, they'll be confident just like Paul was. God most certainly began a good work in you, and by His grace, He will most certainly complete that good work in you. But we want to skip the prerequisite. We want to pervert what comes before. We want to believe in a Christianity that needs no evidence, no proof, no fruit. And don't give me the thief on the cross. If anything, I can see the fruit of God's working within his very short life there on that cross next to Christ. Remember me. This man was a murderer and a blasphemer, but he looked to Christ and he cried aloud. I might suggest to you that that is a public proclamation. Yes, he could do nothing in that state to back it up with certain proofs, but in his death, when uh, certainly you see the truth of a man's heart in his death, and he calls out to Christ, and he relies on Christ. So don't hide behind the thief unless you have at least done what he did. Publicly cried out and relied upon so that everybody looking on, no matter what cross it is you think you hang on, that you bear, that everyone can see that man, that woman is relying on Christ. Amen. If you can't say that, then I'm not confident of anything regarding your faith. I am not confident of anything regarding my own life, unless people can look at it and see the fruits of righteousness in it and see the fruit of the Holy Spirit flowing from my life. Let us not claim these verses and wash them clean of any conviction of sin. Let us not claim these verses and wash them clean of any testimony for Christ. But that's what we do. We, we just want everybody to be confident that they're on their way to heaven. Regardless of the truth of whether they are on their way to heaven. we will stand before a terrifying Christ. Paul said, I know the terror of the Lord. Do you? Are you concerned about standing before Christ? Or is he just this smiling savior that really doesn't care about anything? 
The scripture doesn't present Christ to us like that. The scripture presents to us a terrifying Christ. Paul speaks of it in those terms. When John saw the resurrected Christ, it terrified him so much that he fell to the ground on his face. To see Christ in his glory is not to see Christ in his humanity. Christ condescended. He took on our form. He became like one of us. But don't ever confuse that, that he is one of us. Oh, doctrinally difficult tensions here. Fully God, fully man. But he is fully God, and I'm not. And you're not. So as much as he is one of us, he is not one of us. He is God in the flesh. And we are called to work out our salvation how? In fear. And in trembling. Do I truly believe the things that I profess? How would Peter say it? Yeah, this wasn't just Paul, remember. Peter says it in another way. Peter says... Make your calling and your election sure. Make sure that you have what you say you have. Because I don't want to stand before Christ and have him say, Depart from me, for I never knew you. Ever. You have no part in me. Don't you want to hear Enter into the joy of your Lord? Well done, my good and faithful what? I have to be a servant? Oh, what's that word in Greek that we're uncomfortable with? I have to be a slave of Christ? Are you a slave of Christ? Is your will not your own, but Christ? Can you pray as Jesus did, your example? Not my will, but yours? These are the kind of people, slaves of Christ, in fact, that's how Paul introduces himself with Timothy. Slaves of Christ. It is slaves of Christ that will be glorified in his presence. It is slaves of Christ who have served Christ. Slaves of Christ who have the fruits of the righteousness of Christ. Slaves of Christ who live their lives to bring glory and praise to God and Christ. These are the people of whom we can be, Paul could be, confident. God has started a good work in them. I can see it. And because I know God is faithful, he will complete that work. But if we have no fruit, if we have no evidence, if we have no proof, if we cannot truthfully say, sincerely profess that we are slaves of Christ, then let us not let us not hold to this verse. Let us rather fall before this verse and be convicted by this verse. Let us not take false comfort. Let us not be self-deceived. When I was a young man around 18, 19, and 20 years old and reading through the New Testament for the first time, the one thing that struck me more than anything was twofold. Number one, these letters were written to Christians. Number two, these Christians are constantly being warned not to be self-deceived. Not to profess Christ if they have not truly believed in him and are following him. And this is part of the gospel we have excised. This is something in the church of God we are afraid to touch. We'd rather not touch. It's uncomfortable. We don't like that conviction of sin. Even in what we might call good Bible-believing churches, we just read this verse, and God's just going to take care of everything, no matter how you live, no matter how you appear, no matter who you are. You can profess Christ all the way, apparently, to hell. You can profess Christ to his face. And what will he say to you? Depart from me. I never knew you. But I've done one. I've done things in your name. I have served you but you did it for yourself, but you did it with the wrong motivations, but you didn't truly know me. Well, this verse 
should be a comfort. But it can only and it must only be a comfort to those who are bearing the fruits of righteousness because of their fellowship in the gospel. If you know nothing of being a, a partaker and a sharer and in fellowship with gospel ministry, such as the Philippians were with Paul, then don't ever think you can apply this verse to yourself. If the gospel is only something you think about when you're hearing a sermon or when you go to church, and it's not something that permeates your life, then don't hold this verse. This verse is for people who are filled with the fruits of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is not for, if I can be so blunt, the majority of Christians in our country at least, who two-thirds of which, two-thirds of professing evangelical Christians, never consider darkening the door of a church. Uh, two-thirds. But I'm going to heaven because I'm confident of this very thing that God who began a good work in me, he's going to complete that work whether or not I'm in fellowship with his gospel, whether or not I have the fruits of righteousness, whether or not I'm serving myself rather than being a slave of Christ, I'm confident my pastor told me the Bible says Jesus loves me. And then you'll stand before the one with the fiery piercing eyes who says, get out of my sight. I have never known you. Get, your, get my name out of your mouth and burn in judgment for your false perversion of my gospel. That is a terrifying thought. And it's a thought that used to convict Christians. But no more, because we don't feel comfortable with conviction. We don't want to hear things that make us feel uncomfortable about the way we're living, about the way we're talking, about the way we conduct our affairs, about the things that we do and the things that we say. We don't like that. We just want to be confident without the evidence. We just want the work of God without the work of His Spirit. We just want to stand before Christ and have Him smile at us without first kneeling at His cross and crying out to Him. And this is one of the great shames of evangelical Christianity in our country and in the West. And if we don't deal with this verse, this passage, this gospel today, Jesus will deal with you and with me one day at his day when we stand before him because every one of us, whether we believe or whether we don't, we will all stand before him. We will all bow down before him. And some, he will say to the sheep on his right hand, come on in to the kingdom that I prepared for you. But will you be, will I be on the wrong side, on the left? Will I be one of the goats who are banished to outer darkness. How many Christians, professing Christians, evangelical Christians, will be the goats on the left? These are things for us to think about, to be sober-minded about, and to consider. I don't try to stand here to bring people doubt regarding their salvation if indeed it is truly found in Christ himself. And indeed, if their life is producing the fruit of Christ, as the New Testament says. But I am here to remind us that we live in a time and in an age where the churches in our country, even the good ones, are blind to conviction of sin and are blind to the glory and praise of God through a life that honors Him. With that, let us pray. Heavenly Father, for the few here that are gathered in your name, I pray that these words will not fall hollow and empty, but that all of us will realize that you must be all and in all, that our lives must be evidenced of your love and your grace through us. If we are to profess your love and your grace, then people must see that love and grace in us. And so, Father, might you stir within our hearts. Might you bring that conviction that we so often shun. And might you help us, Lord, to truly bear the fruits of the righteousness of Jesus Christ in our life so that we can be unashamedly confident 
that you have begun the good work and that you will complete that work and that we will stand before the Christ who died for us, who gave his life for us and who loves us and who has prepared a place for us and who is our great protector, the one who is our deliverer and our redeemer, the one who walks with us day by day. Father, let our Christianity be true. Let it be genuine. In Jesus' name, amen.